Hello and welcome to the second session of our virtual training series on local government law. For those of you who are unable to attend the first session, the trainings are intended to provide a concise overview of the legal aspects of being a local elected or appointed government official. The sessions are based on select chapters from the book, Local Government Law, a practical guidebook for public officials on city councils, community boards, and planning commissions, authored by our presenter, Jerry Fisher. Jerry is a well-known and respected land use attorney with decades of experience working throughout Southeast Michigan. Before we get started, I just want to remind folks that the session is being recorded and also to direct your questions to Jim Schaefer using the chat function in Zoom. So let's get started. Please welcome Jerry Fisher. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome. A thousand hellos to everyone. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share your uh, noon time today. And uh, in uh, designing this uh, session, I have attempted to include information uh, not regularly uh, discussed in, in uh, local government presentations, uh, particularly the uh, matters that we'll cover in the third part on uh, constitutional law, but uh, the, uh, op uh, the procedural rules I think will be uh, interesting as well. And, uh, and of course, Freedom of Information Act is always uh, a great thing to, uh, to discuss. Uh, so this is a presentation based on a, a book that, uh, that I wrote recently. And uh, uh, hopefully that, uh, that if, you, if you see any, any good reason to get it, it's available on Amazon and, and uh, uh, other places. All right. Let's get started. Uh, this is um, uh, the, the beginning session of, uh, of part number one is the procedural rules for meetings. Uh, and this will be essentially uh, 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 based on Robert's rules of order. Uh, question number one is why do we have and why do we learn rules of order? Uh, the answer to that, uh, simple enough, is Knowledge can be power in these kinds of situations. When you go to a meeting and you are aware of the rules, uh, you have a, a better opportunity to uh, maneuver and uh, not let uh, other people, including uh, uh, bullies who happen to know the, the rules very well, uh, uh, take over merely by being the loudest person in the room and, and uh, having this uh, command of, of this, this type of uh, rules. So having orderly and productive meetings uh, would be enhanced by knowing these rules. And as I mentioned, we're gonna look at uh, Robert's rules of order uh, that uh, many communities adopt either in, in full or in part, and some communities adopt Robert, Robert's rules as supplemented by uh, rules that, that they have uh, included or added. Uh, and uh, as you may know, Robert's rules are rooted in the British House of Commons and, uh, and that uh, those rules were then uh, adapted in good part by the United States House of Representatives, largely uh, drafted by uh, Thomas Jefferson. So the way we're going to look at uh, the presentation of, uh, of the rules of order is that we're going to drop into a hypothetical council meeting, uh, which um, and, and during the course of the meeting, we'll, we'll discuss various rules as they come up in, uh, in the normal course of business. And we pick up uh, at this meeting when the public body is debating how the community can preserve some of its last remaining open space in the interest of uh, quality of life and other objectives. There's a, a little um, a campaign for open space. Uh, so the, what we have here is a citizen petition has been submitted seeking to spend money to purchase uh, land in order to preserve a view shed, uh, which is unique to this community. Now, uh, so this is uh, at the beginning of, of what we're going to talk about here. The first thing that has to happen uh, in order to get the discussion going is that the proposal, a proposal has to be put on the floor for discussion. So and on the floor of the meeting, in other words, uh, it's the it's it's the uh, place where the discussion occurs. So a floor really is not a, a floor as such, but it's the place where the discussion occurs. And in order to get uh, a topic on the floor, 
uh, under most rules, you've got to have a motion made by one of the members of the body, and then that has to be seconded. So in this case, we have member Nolan who offers a motion to make the expenditure of $200,000 proposed in the citizen petition for the land purchase. And uh, so now we need a second. That second is provided by member Victor. So this two-step process, the motion in second, then places a main motion uh, on the floor for discussion. So after the discussion, whenever there's a main motion there, there's the possibility of and likelihood that there'll be a vote after the discussion. Uh, so now we're going to have a deliberation on this motion, uh, and we're going to encounter our first uh, rule maneuver, uh, namely a motion to postpone. So uh, once a motion is put on the floor, the chair would normally recognize the maker of the motion who would then explain what the intent uh, of the motion is uh, and, uh, and maybe the reasoning for it. And in this case, however, uh, before the chair is able to call on member Nolan, a member Newbeck uh, seeks to be recognized to speak. And uh, so she is going to uh, uh, illustrate our first maneuver from the normal course of discussion under, under the rules. Newbeck questions uh, whether or not we've got enough information to properly discuss the motion. And to deal with that, uh, Newbeck makes a motion to postpone the discussion on the main motion to the next meeting. So that would be to a particular uh, time and date uh, 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 for postponement. Uh, so here's a, another motion. The chair seeks a, a second for the motion. Member Ritchie offers the second. So uh, normally, uh, as, as far as rules of order are concerned, uh, you can't have two main motions at the same time on the floor. That's the typical situation. But a motion to postpone is not a main motion. A post motion to postpone to a definite uh, date and time is known as a subsidiary motion. In this case, subsidiary because it merely seeks to process a process for the main motion. So uh, as a result of that, this motion is in order. And not only that, but it takes priority over further discussion on the main motion. Uh, and one more point about this, in some cases, uh, a, a subsidiary motion that comes up um, is not debatable. It, it, it's something that, so the chair would go right to a vote on, on the motion. We'll get to an example of that in just a second. So in this case now, uh, the motion is open for discussion, meaning it's debatable. So. Let me pause here because, and, and a motion to postpone is a, is a very frequent uh, motion that is made. Uh, but another motion that is just as frequent and in some cases is made uh, with the expectation that it actually is a motion to postpone. People make a motion to table <laughs> thinking they're making a motion to postpone. So the big difference or one, one of the big differences is that a motion to postpone will automatically reschedule the discussion on the main motion to another date and time. Uh, so it'll automatically come back on the table for a discussion. On the other hand, a motion to table actually removes the main motion from discussion indefinitely. It may never come up again, but uh, the typical thing is it'll be removed from the table uh, and then at some time in the future, could be later in the same meeting, but another meeting, a new motion is made to bring it back to the, fl to the floor. Uh, now, as I mentioned, this is a motion to table is an example of a motion that is not debatable. So once a motion to table is made, the uh, chair would go right to a vote on the motion to table. And uh, uh, so, so those are some of the big differences, and, I, and it's good to know the difference between the motion to postpone and motion to table and going to another date and time, even later time in the meeting, 
uh, is uh, would be a motion to postpone. That's the correct motion for that. Um, so we'll assume here that the motion to postpone is debated, voted on, but it fails. So it doesn't pass, doesn't get a majority vote. That means that the main motion uh, returns for discussion. So now we have deliberation on the main motion to uh, spend the money uh, for to purchase the open space. Uh, and now we're going to see the next uh, action, the motion to amend. So uh, after the maker of the motion, Nolan, after he's spoken and others have had the opportunity to, to address the motion, uh, member Kaplan employs the next uh, rules maneuver. Kaplan states that uh, there's a need for a clearer plan for the project in question. We don't have enough detail for this. Uh, and so if we vote on it, we don't know enough about what we're voting on. So he makes a motion to amend, amend the main motion by conditioning the expenditure of funds on the council's approval of a project plan to sub be submitted by staff. Again, the chair looks for a second. And that's offered by member Newbeck. Uh, and so this is another uh, subsidiary motion. Uh, it's, it's in order. And the chair calls for debate on the amendment. Now note that the debate at this point is only on the amendment. So it, the main motion is kind of put aside for a moment. And the discussion or debate is on the amendment only. Once that debate is completed, the chair will then call for a vote, but it's only on the amendment. So everybody is deciding whether to amend the main motion or not. And so uh, once there's a vote on the amendment, the discussion will then return to the, to the main motion. If the motion to amend passes, the debate will be on the main motion as amended. If it fails, the debate will then return to discussion on the main motion without regard to the amendment. So here we assume that, that the motion to amend passes, which means then that the main motion is, is the motion to spend $200,000 to acquire this property, but it's conditioned upon the, uh, uh, the submission of a, of a plan by staff and not only submission, but approval of, of a plan by staff. So the next maneuver then is gonna be a motion to call the question. Uh, so deliberation proceeds on the uh, main motion as amended. And uh, uh, after considerable debate, member Parlov concludes that the discussion is merely duplicating what has already been stated. And I know that sounds familiar to some of you. You sit through a meeting and people start saying things the second time. And when they start saying things a third time, somebody might make a motion to call the question. Uh, so it would be a motion to call the question on the main motion as amended. So calling the question means it's going to be brought forward for a vote without any further debate. So it's a powerful tool and will abruptly end debate without further discussion. Uh, so this motion, uh, like the motion to table, not debatable, goes right to a vote. And because it can cut off further discussion that some may, may not desire, but some people may desire further discussion. Uh, um, and, and because it, it has such a, a, a powerful impact, it requires a two thirds majority vote because you're really stopping people from participating in, in the dialogue and have, you have to have two thirds majority for that. So if it passes, if this, Call the question passes, the chair will immediately call for a vote on the main motion as amended. If it fails, debate will continue without departure in the normal proceedings on the main motion uh, as amended. So uh, we've discussed uh, several maneuvers that come up regularly. Uh, uh, there's inf insufficient time in this uh, program. Uh, we could, you know, we could spend a whole half day uh, talking about a lot of these things. And, uh, but uh, I do recommend uh, that you read up and at least the following often utilized uh, uh, rules. One would be motion to limit debate. And so this would be a, 
a, a rule that allows you to, to set a time limit for further discussion. Motion to reconsider. I'm sure everybody's heard of this. Um, so this would be something that, uh, an action that had actually been passed before, uh, maybe in, on the same day or in the previous meeting. And technically you can't go back further than, than the previous meeting uh, to review the prior action. Uh, and then there are some stipulations of when this can apply, when it can't apply. A uh, motion to rescind, again, a review, but this time it would be a motion to actually do away with, with something that had been proved in the past, approved in the past. And then finally, point of order, this would be a, 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 a interruption, you might say, a, uh, a, an offer by somebody uh, on the uh, on the council that, uh, raises a point of order on uh, uh, appealing an application of a procedural rule as it is as it is, as it has played out does not require a second and uh, and usually the chair deals with with these issues okay uh, subject to any questions that people will have at the end of our session uh, we're going to move on to the Freedom of Information Act uh, public access to local government records. And uh, this is uh, a uh, a uh, set of rules in Michigan, the uh, uh, Freedom of Information Act that uh, came along in the 1970s. Uh, the core purpose of the Freedom of Information Act, uh, you know, as stated in various uh, appellate cases, along with the Open Meetings Act, is to help the public understand government operations and activities. So. Getting the getting the documents used by the government, uh, inner office things used by the government uh, will help people understand. Just like uh, the ability to to attend a meeting and and participate. The the obligation of the government uh, in the Freedom of Information Act uh, is to make available requested public records make available requested public records. And like the Open Meetings Act, uh, the government's obligation to do that has exceptions. And we will talk about some of them, but there are uh, quite a number of them. But uh, a general exception, a general exception, uh, not one of the exceptions stated in the act, but a general exception uh, there's no obligation by the government to create a new public record in, res in response to a request for, for the government to do that. In other words, there's no obligation to compile a summary of information. Uh, uh, there's no uh, obligation to make a report of existing records that the government has, uh, et cetera. Um, nor is there an obligation to respond to uh, persons who are incarcerated in state and local correction facilities. And, and uh, that this exception had not been in the original act and it became an overwhelming uh, issue for people, for local governments to, uh, particularly and the state uh, to respond to these. And so the, so the, uh, it's just a general um, exception to the rule. So who carries out? this responsibility on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in re to respond to FOIA requests, it would be the FOIA coordinator. So this is a person that has a fair amount of authority uh, to uh, interpret requests and make the responses, obligation to make the responses on a timely basis. And uh, in the absence of, uh, of a designation, uh, the default here is that the chief administrative officer of the community, like city manager, uh, probably the township supervisor, uh, would be uh, the FOIA coordinator. Uh, but the, the, the expectation under the statute is that that the, uh, the legislative body would designate a FOIA coordinator, often somebody in the clerk's office who has the uh, records readily available. A couple key definitions in the act. Uh, obviously, uh, public record is uh, needs to be defined uh, because this is what the FOIA intends to make available, uh, and it's a fairly 
broad definition, writings prepared, owned, used in the possession of or retained by a public body in the performance of an official function from the time they are created. So, so if the local government has the document uh, and it, it's part of the performance of the, of the local government's function, it's probably gonna be a public record. Uh, it includes like hard copies that are kept in a file cabinet. It also includes electronic materials kept on a hard drive. Um, it does not include software, of course, because that would be a patented sort of copyrighted uh, information. But it's it's all of these uh, hard uh, hard copies, electronic information, as long as it's not covered by an exemption specified in the Act. Another uh, key word, uh, key phrase is public body, and uh, this is much broader than than the same term used in the Open Meetings Act. And in the Open Meetings Act, as you recall, the uh, public body is the policy making body typically the legislative body of, of a community it could be other decision makers and policy makers in the community but here in terms of records nearly all government records are are important or could be important and so public body is going to be uh, almost synonymous with the local government itself uh, one question that came up in one case is whether this uh, would include uh, records kept by consultants, such as the local government's uh, legal counsel. And uh, the indication, there's only been one case on it, but the indication by the court on this subject is that it in some part uh, depends on how, how this uh, person is designated in the city charter or state statute and so forth. But be aware that uh, a consultant might be considered part of the public body. Now here is uh, an obligation that uh, that I think uh, can be overlooked by some communities, and I think it's important to be aware of it, is that the uh, body must establish procedures and guidelines for implementing the act uh, and create some written uh, public uh, create a written public summary and make it available to people. How to submit a written request, deposit requirements, fee calculations. Uh, avenues for challenge uh, and appeal. And here's a key point. Uh, these days, most communities have a website and uh, under the statute, uh, uh, this uh, the procedures and guidelines uh, must be posted and maintained uh, on the website. So that's something to be uh, keenly aware of. Okay, how do you start the process of uh, um, of uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, operation. Number one would be, uh, step one would be a written request. So the statute doesn't merely say, pick up the phone and I'm gonna make a Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, it requires a written request and this triggers the operation of the act. Uh, and the person making the request has the obligation to provide a, su a sufficient description to allow the public body to find the document, find the find the record. Now, because the purpose of the act is is consumer oriented, you might say, to make information available, uh, the court is going to um, uh, require the local government to be reasonable uh, in interpreting the request. And so, if there's a slight ambiguity, the, the local government may have to figure it out. And uh, and uh, do it the best it can on on the request that's been made. Obviously, there are limits to doing that. Okay, the FOIA response has to be made in uh, five days, five business days, uh, which can be very short. And you know, for a for a, a record uh, that is short, like one page, uh, easy to find, no problem with five days. There may be a a, a need to extend that time, and the act allows an extension with stated reasons for up to an additional 10 days, 10 business days. Uh, and another thing that I always uh, encourage uh, the FOIA uh, coordinator to do is if, if there's going to be a problem is to, is to talk to the, the person making the request and see if you can work out an agreement. 
Uh, the one thing I do suggest in that regard, though, if you do agree on more time or special terms, like providing them over a period of time, put it in writing and send it back to the person uh, to confirm what, what, what the arrangement is. Now, the response can be in one of three forms. And obviously, for the person making the request, they, they would like the request to be granted in its entirety, provide all the information sought. And so that's possibility number one. Number two would be a denial of the request in its entirety. And in this instance, the FOIA uh, coordinator's got to state the reasons for the denial and also provide the requester with their rights of, of any uh, recourse they have, such as making an appeal, uh, going to court and so forth. Uh, and then the third, which is certainly not unusual, would be to grant the request in part and to deny the request in part. Uh, and a denial can include a redacting, uh, a, a partial denial can include redacting certain materials that are in the record that is provided. And to the extent that there is a denial, uh, uh, then again, as in the a full denial, the reasons have to be stated and the, the rights of appeal and, and going to court have to be stated. Fees, important thing to know about. This, is a, this, this makes the uh, FOIA uh, dangerous in some ways. Uh, and I use the word dangerous in, in quotes. Uh, so if the person making the request prevails, fully prevails uh, uh, in, uh, in, an, in a lawsuit that is, that is started to enforce the act, the court shall, this isn't the court may, this is the court shall uh, uh, grant attorney's fees and costs and disbursements. So that, that can be a lot of money if there's a big fight. Uh, if the person or public body prevails in part, in part, the court may in its discretion award all or any portion of reasonable attorney's fees, costs, and disbursements. So if the court finds that this is really a bad faith request, the court might award uh, might award attorney fees in some amount to the local government. And if it's a good faith, but the government has attempted to comply, uh, it uh, the, the court might grant uh, a partial. Okay, exemptions from disclosure. 28 categories of exempt records. And, and this is a list that has been uh, uh, supplemented over the years uh, as further things, uh, for litigation comes up and uh, things that hadn't been uh, uh, thought about uh, initially. Uh, and so obviously I'm not going to discuss 28 categories of exempt records, but I'm going to talk about uh, four uh, categories uh, that uh, come up often. Three categories come up most often, and one is a little more controversial that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, probably one of the most prominent uh, would be the privacy exemption, and this results in many instances in making redactions or covering information up on the document. And this would be uh, uh, information that has two uh, qualities. Quality number, and it has to meet both. Quality number one would be that the information is of a personal nature, uh, and also that disclosure uh would be an unwarranted invasion of an individual's privacy. And this might be, for example, a private address or phone number of, of somebody uh, in the local government or elsewhere that uh, uh, that is included in the document. It might be redacted. And so that would be redacted on the basis of a privacy exemption. Law enforcement exemption. Uh, and uh, the most common situation here is that that somebody will ask for a police report or record that, that has been made. And uh, to the extent that it would disclose uh, investigatory uh, information that uh, is subject to an ongoing case, uh, the law enforcement agency is probably gonna say, uh, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, uh, 
enforce an exemption on that. Attorney-client privilege exemption. So just as in the Open Meetings Act, where there is an attorney-client privilege exemption, so if there's a written document uh, from the uh, attorney that is of a legal nature, it has matters of law in it, not just fact, but law, uh, and uh, or discusses matters of client confidence, that uh, uh, can be the basis of, of uh, an exemption from, from uh, disclosure. Uh, now, this is one that is often contentious uh, and is, a, and is a, you have to be very careful in claiming this exemption. It's called the Frank Communications Exemption. Uh, and it includes communications and notes within the public body or between public bodies of an advisory nature. Uh, so why is this, uh, can this be contentious? Because it has to meet three requirements that can be subjective in nature. First, it, it has to cover other than purely factual materials and uh, is preliminary to a final agency determination of policy or action. So it's leading to an ultimate determination. And, and third, it does not apply unless the public body shows that the public interest in encouraging frank communication between officials and employees of public bodies clearly outweighs the public interest in disclosure in that situation. So as you can see, uh, especially prong number three, very subjective. Uh, it puts the burden on the local government to demonstrate the reason why why it should be exempted to frank communication between officials is, uh, outweighs it. In other words, it can't be something that would embarrass the community or embarrass uh, somebody in the community. Uh, it's got, there actually has to be something that outweighs the public interest in disclosure. It's kind of, kind of overturning the underlying purpose of, of the act. So be, be cautious in, in the use of this one. Okay, let's turn to the third uh, segment of uh, today's session, uh, federal constitutional limits on uh, local governments. This is a, a, a segment, as I mentioned, that, that you don't hear very often. Uh, and uh, I, I think this is very important background information to understand a lot of the limitations on local government and also a lot of the litigation that occurs. Uh, and we start this discussion with a summary of uh, three uh, Civil War constitutional amendments that, uh, that occurred in, in the United States. So this was between the years 1865 and 1870. Uh, obviously a crucial time in our history. Uh, and so we look at the United States Constitution, we uh, have to understand that it originally was intended to provide a direct authority and limitations exclusively applicable to the federal government uh, and not applicable to the state governments. The states retain the autonomy to govern without the limitation of like the first, and then these are just examples, without the limitation of, of the First Amendment, free speech and religion. That was a matter for the states to decide. The Fourth Amendment, freedom from unreasonable searches of, by the government, that was not applicable to the states. The Fifth Amendment, due process, and many other rights in the Fifth Amendment, uh, and other basic limitations uh, applicable in the original Constitution, plus the Bill of Rights. They were not applicable to the states. So the states were permitted essentially to figure out most things for themselves. And that, that applied for a long time, but the Civil War brought about a major change to this initial format and in state insulation. So a century later, after, almost a century after the, uh, the founding of the country, the Civil War uh, provided a sufficient motivation to finally address the national racial divide. Uh, and just as a footnote on this, uh, Thomas Jefferson obviously wrote the uh, Declaration of Independence. It was one of the one of the key documents relating to the Constitution. And um, 
publicly, he was opposed to slavery, uh, uh, even though we understand that he owned slaves himself, but publicly he referred to slavery as moral depravity. Uh, and um, as, as you may know that in the uh, declaration, uh, Jefferson and of the others that ultimately approved it, uh, set forth a number of grievances that uh, uh, King George of England had, had perpetrated. And in the initial draft of the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson actually blamed King George for his role in creating and perpetrating the uh, transatlantic uh, save, slave trade, which he effectively described as a, a crime against humanity. So uh, that, to me, that's worthwhile understanding, even though we know uh, that uh, Jefferson was a slave owner himself, uh, but, but the, the provisions that related and allowed, permitted slavery, didn't prohibit slavery, were in the Constitution for a whole, ye whole hundred years. Uh, and uh, after the Civil War, the Constitution is amended to address the most pressing racial issues at the time. 13th Amendment, abolition of slavery. 14th Amendment, uh, granted citizenship, uh, granted due process, and equal protection. In other words, made uh, the due process, equal protection, and citizenship applicable to the states expressly, expressly applicable to say no state shall violate due process or equal protection. And third, the 15th Amendment was passed uh, providing voting rights, the Voting Rights Amendment, very, very critical. Uh, and what is not clear uh, in general uh, to the public, uh, but should be, is that over time, in the fullness of time, the 14th Amendment was interpreted by the Supreme Court to have an even more per pervasive effect on the country as a whole, beyond citizenship, due process, and equal protection. And this is very important. So over many years, many court decisions, it has been determined that most of the critical liberties in the Bill of Rights, so you've got Bill of Rights, you've got the first 10 amendments and nine of those have very important liberties stated in them. Uh, and, that, and the courts have determined that most of the critical uh, uh, liberties stated in the Bill of Rights are applicable to the states through the 14th Amendment, even though it, it's not expressly stated. So, and that's how uh, the, the protection and the limitation on local governments can be broader than, than may otherwise appear. So the 14th Amendment, major game changer in terms of, of the original orientation of the Constitution, and it removed considerable autonomy from the states and established important federal constitutional limitations on the states. And of course, the states include local governments. and so. Uh, that 14th Amendment is, is a major element in, uh, in limiting local governments in their, in their actions. And we'll talk about some of the key limitations in a moment. But I do want to add another point that I think is, is important to recognize, and that is that, that Congress got in on the act of limitation. Under the 14th Amendment, there are five sections, and the fifth section allows Congress to have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the, the provisions of, of the 14th Amendment. Uh, and so, you know, Congress can't just pass laws that aren't authorized in the Constitution. This section basically allows the, the Congress to go far, far, much farther afield in passing laws uh, ostensibly on the basis that, that they're needed. Now, they, there's, they're, the 14th Amendment has to have some uh, history of, of violation in order for Congress to, uh, to, to pass legislation on a particular subject, but Congress hasn't seemed to have that much difficulty doing that. So uh, at approximately the time of the 14th Amendment, Congress enacts a series of civil rights laws uh, one of, of them being Title 42, Section 1983. And many of you have heard about this section because 
uh, it's the basis of many, many lawsuits uh, against local governments for money damages. Because this section allows, as it's been interpreted, allows money damage cases and equitable uh, remedies uh, uh, for a private person who suffers a violation of the Constitution or, or federal law. So that's a, a major uh, uh, event. So Congress then limits local government action by passing these, these uh, this state uh, uh, legislation, uh, by uh, federal legislation. Now, another thing that is not well understood uh, is the fact that the court got into actually creating limitations against local governments on a somewhat of an indirect basis, but critical basis. So during World War II, in 1938, this is before the United States had formally got, it, got into the war, uh, the Supreme Court decided a case had almost nothing to do with civil rights called Caroline Products case. I think it had to do with milk prices or something of that effect, some, some uh, you know, tangential thing. But in that opinion, a footnote, I think it's footnote four, of that opinion uh, that uh, one of the justices over uh, making a speech called it the most famous footnote in constitutional history. And in that footnote, the court began the creation, not an interpretation, but the creation of what has become known as strict scrutiny review by the court of legislation restricting things such as free speech, religious exercise, the right to vote, other laws that appear to discriminate against racial and national minorities who lack political clout in legislatures and therefore need closer uh, scrutiny of actions by the legislature who might, be, might feel a, a little freer to pass a statute that won't be uh, uh, objected to by a majority of voters. And so the court took it upon itself to start creating this document. And believe me that, and I'll discuss this a little bit further, strict scrutiny by far is a major game changer uh, in uh, uh, interpretation of the validity of statutes, particularly statutes that relate to uh, uh, liberties and other rights. So if you take a look at the impact on local government uh, as a result of, of these, the, the constitutional amendments, uh, Congress getting into this act, and then the judicial actions, these things are huge uh, and are very relevant to the limitation on local governments. And I'm gonna cover just a, a, a few things here. Uh, due process. So due process uh, is in the Fifth Amendment, not initially applicable to the states. Due process is included in the 14th Amendment, and it restricts local governments uh, in two ways. Uh, first of all, where the local government is going to deprive somebody's liberty or their property, uh, this due process applies. Now, just as an aside, uh, due process also protects life, so life, liberty, and property. But uh, life, life is really not generally an issue in local government matters. But if the government is going to take action that deprives property or liberty, the obligation is to provide the person with notice first and give them the right to be heard on whether or not this, this uh, rule should be applied to them. Second, and in many instances, just as important and maybe more important is substantive due process. And here the court analyzed whether the government is achieving a sufficient interest to justify depriving property. Now note, strict scrutiny of laws impacting fundamental rights will raise the bar on whether there's a, a sufficient interest. And what the court has indicated then is that if a law is passed that has an impact on uh, racial or national minorities or other fundamental rights, 
then the government has to show an extremely, the government's got the burden to show an extremely uh, strong, compelling interest for passing the law and that it can't, can't achieve that interest in any lesser impactful way. Uh, and uh, so this opens the door in many uh, situations to a challenge to a law, invalidation of a law. Uh, for example, the most one of the most recent significant uh, uh, acts where this got involved would be uh, state laws that prohibited same-sex marriage. So the, the court deciding the case said that under due process, uh, there weren't a, there weren't sufficient interests by the government to go so far to uh, prevent uh, same-sex marriage. And that was because the act is uh, reviewed under strict scrutiny because it impacted uh, personal liberties. Second, equal protection. Uh, local governments are subject to uh, the constitutional protection uh, by the requirement of equal protection. That's dictated in the 14th Amendment, and there's no counterpart expressly stated in the Fifth Amendment. Uh, although, <laughs> it's, I suppose I should quickly point out that that when um, uh, the uh, uh, cases were decided that that set aside uh, separate but equal and uh, school segregation segregation and so forth, uh, the court said that it applied against the federal government as well. That that you you have to by implication if it applies against the states equal protection has to apply against the federal government, even though there's no place in the law that, that makes equal protection applicable to the federal government. So what is, uh, what is equal protection? It does, it's not a protection on whether certain rights can be enforced against local government or other people. It's rather, it, it applies when a local government is intentionally, and the word intentional is important there, is intentionally discriminating against one class of persons over another class without justifiable reason. And again, strict scrutiny, if it applies, would make it more difficult for the government to show justifiable reason. And so here you have uh, a statute that, that might discriminate on the basis of race, and that is going to be reviewed by strict scrutiny. That means if there is a statute uh, like that, it's very unlikely that it's going to be that it will that will survive strict scrutiny. One of the one of the points made by one of the justices in a, in a case was that if a case if a, a law is subjected to strict scrutiny, it has almost no chance of of prevailing. That doesn't mean that that it can't prevail, but it's a tough a tough road for local governments. Free speech. Local governments may not regulate in a manner that violates the First Amendment free speech rights. Another huge, huge uh, a change in the original contemplation of the Constitution. The First Amendment protects free expression of ideas, protects points of view, uh, and indirectly then the right to make expressions and object to things protects all the other rights in the, uh, that, that we have. Uh, and so the court will give strict scrutiny uh, to a government regulation that attempts to restrict the content of a person's ideas or views. In other words, their expression of an idea, if it's restricting the content of their expressions, that's going to be strict scrutiny. In all likelihood, the law goes down. Uh, and uh, particular local government issues in this regard would be sign regulations. Uh, in a, a recent case, sign regulations were really uh, knocked out on a widespread basis. Adult entertainment, uh, it applies there. The, and as you, as you probably know, adult entertainment regulations have to be very, very, very carefully prepared in order to avoid strict scrutiny. Uh, and then another one, the speech of government employees. Uh, uh, can get involved here, particularly if the speech does not involve activities that occur in the course of, of employment of, of a person that is challenging the speech uh, requirement by an employer. Finally, uh, freedom of religion. 
Uh, local governments are restricted in their interference with freedom of religion. Two sides of this coin, establishment clause and free exercise clause. Uh, the establishment clause prevents the government from creating or requiring a particular religion, like the Church of England was created in, in England. That was the response of this was of the freedom of, of, of the establishment clause was that. Uh, uh, or favoring religion over no religion. Uh, the example of this would be uh, where in school attempting to teach a particular religion to a third grade class. So, so if everything is, is uh, focused on a particular Christian religion, uh, that might be prohibited, in fact, is pro prohibited in public schools. Uh, contrast that to, to a prayer uh, that is uh, required or recited at the beginning of a city, village, township, or county meeting. Uh, the court uh, held in uh, Township of Greece versus Galloway in 1914 or 19, 2014 that, uh, that that is probably permissible uh, because adults can, uh, can handle things more than third graders can. And uh, uh, you know, with as long as as long as uh, 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 that the prayer is not a, a participating in the prayer is not a condition of any action or approvals given and so forth. Uh, free exercise clause. So the government has to allow a person to exercise the religion of their choice without a substantial burden uh, by the government. So, for example, in school, uh, if the school permits book club meetings, math club meetings, and so forth. Then, then the government is going to have a very difficult time under the free exercise clause of not allowing Bible study program because it's not favoring religion over no religion or favoring one religion over another, but it's allowing religion to have its fair share of the time. Free exercise clause, very complicated. I'm not going to try to explain it uh, with full clarity, but it's a tough one. And, uh, and, uh, so uh, we'll get into uh, questions, and uh, hopefully you, you've enjoyed uh, all these three sessions, and, and uh, I've, I've particularly enjoyed providing them today, and uh, the constitutional uh, provisions that, uh, that I happen to know from teaching constitutional law. Uh, it was a particular pleasure to try to put those into uh, a local government language. Uh, hey, Jim, are any, any questions? Yes, there are, Jerry. Thanks. Excellent presentation. Uh, first up, uh, does a motion to table require a second? Yes, motion to table requires a second. Okay. That the uh, the uh, a point of order does not require a second, but motion to table does. Okay. Uh, second question is, a member makes a main motion. Assume that there is then a motion to amend, which passes, thereby amending the main motion. May the moving member then withdraw their original motion? Well, that's an interesting question uh, because at this point now it's it's uh, as as amended. Uh, you know, I I, I don't want to give you a, a direct answer to that. I I can try to research that and see if I can get an answer and uh, provide it to uh, it, uh, Jim and Ryan. Okay. Then everybody can bother you. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. We'll, we'll take that as a you'll follow up. I'll follow okay. up. All right, uh, next question. Uh, can another member make a motion to amend a motion that is made by another member or does the original motion maker have to make the motion to amend or at least agree to the amendment? Uh, any member can make the motion to amend. Uh, it has to be seconded. And uh, there, there's no obligation that uh, the motion maker agree to it. Now, what might be, be going through somebody's head here is that quite often uh, there's a motion on the floor and then somebody says, would you agree to a friendly amendment? In other words, a friendly amendment without going through a motion to amend. And if the original motion maker says, yes, I'll make that part of my motion. And then the seconder says, that's part of my second. Uh, then there's no need to go through any other procedure. Okay, excellent. Uh, next question, uh, should personal information that is written uh, in written comments that we receive for public hearings before planning commissions or the ZBA be redacted 
before those comments are made public, such as telephone numbers, email addresses, and such. Uh, yeah, and I think they, they would be redacted in the normal course, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, excellent. Uh, we don't have any other questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll give it maybe a couple of seconds here if people do have a last minute question. Um, and while we're waiting on that, Jerry, can you uh, go to the next slide? Sure. And we just wanted folks to know uh, that we are announcing we are going to have four additional sessions uh, with Jerry covering the remaining chapters of his books. Uh, so you can look for additional information on that. Uh, we are planning them in March, May, July, and September, and we're working out the scheduling uh, right now with Jerry. Uh, so you'll be uh, hearing more about that in the very near future. And you have, I, I'm not going to disclose what secrets Jim has on me for yeah. <laughs> going forward with this. All right, Jerry, we did get another question. Um, is the public required to give their addresses in a public meeting? Yes. Yeah, I think that's a very common thing. Again, that, that can be redacted and it probably should be redacted uh, for purposes other than the clerk's record keeping. But yeah, name and address is very common, very, and, uh, and, and essentially, I think it, it provides uh, important information. Number one, it allows the, the clerk to contact a person if there is a, a question about what they've indicated. Uh, it also indicates whether that person is a citizen or non-citizen. Um, whether they're a citizen or non-citizen doesn't mean that they have, don't have a right to speak, but in some instances, uh, it, it basically gives some, some indication of whether the person is close to the subject and so forth. I mean, like, like in a zoning situation, it might be a person next door, uh, and their comments might be a lot more relevant than a person that lives uh, in the next community. Jerry, a common follow-up on that is, um, uh, what about when uh, meetings are live broadcast and recorded? Uh, redaction becomes more problematic? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question because uh, many meetings are uh, broadcast uh, live now, even though even though the law has changed that, that an official meeting, the members of the members of the of the body can't participate officially uh, online, uh, and I think that um, so that that is something that that must be uh, taken into consideration, and and the uh, and the uh, speaker can certainly uh, uh, indicate to the clerk that they'll provide that uh, offline. Okay, all right. Uh, the next question is just a general one. Uh, can we rewatch this session? If so, how? If you look up at the first note in the chat, uh, there's a link and all future sessions, including this one, will be posted there. So you just uh, check on that link in the future and they'll be posted uh, shortly. Um, let's see. Uh, another comment, uh, we had another training and that person said that it was not mandatory uh, for someone to give their address in a public meeting. So. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. And another follow-up, would they have to say it on the microphone? Some people complain about not wanting to have that made public. Right. And, and I think generally speaking, uh, addresses can be considered to be information of a personal nature and that Disclosure uh, might might create some other kind of uh, problems, and so uh, that makes perfect sense. Okay. Uh, another question on the slides. Uh, the recordings will be available uh, at the link provided in the chat. And then final question: uh, In the future, uh, perhaps Jerry could flush out his views on the Supreme Court's uh, sign decision, and. Uh, then just to follow up, if a member of the public refuses to give their address at a public hearing at which they are speaking, uh, can they be precluded from speaking? Well, I, as I mentioned, I, I think let's assume that, that there is a, uh, a rule of order that requires the address be given. I would say uh, in, in light of the privacy problem, I think I think the speaker could agree to give the give the address offline. OK. And if, and if they absolutely refuse to do that, then then they in the rules require it. Uh, that could be a problem that would have to be uh, uh, debated. Okay. 
Excellent. Well, Jerry, that is the, the last question. I want to thank you again for an excellent presentation. And then just to remind folks, uh, look at that link at the uh, top of the chat. Uh, we will be posting this and all future sessions. And also look in your inbox uh, soon. We'll be announcing the dates for the future four sessions. So, Jerry, once again, thank you very much. Thank you for very much. Uh, I really, really appreciate it and, uh, and enjoy uh, presenting this uh, program.